So let's do now this reading introduction to industry and company analysis. <clears throat> okay, so our focus in equity investment is analyzing companies, analyzing stocks. Now to analyze companies or stocks, you need to know in and out about the financials of the company, the ratios, the company's projections, growth and everything, right? But what matters more is that the company, what business the company is into, what is the industry the company into, what is the sector that company belongs to. Because we know that a company's stock price is not only impacted by its internal factors, but more from the external factors, which is what we call as systematic risk. So these are the market related factors which affects your stock or your company more than anything else. So we need to know the positioning of the company in the industry, the future outlook of the industry, the overall outlook of the sector and the economy. And we will, after that, we'll uh, understand the impact of all these factors into the company's valuation. So company's valuation is just not the inherent valuation or the fundamentals of the company, but broadly it is also dependent on what market it is into. And that's where industry or company analysis becomes very, very, very important uh, step, or I should say a very important component of analyzing a company. So our objective in equity investment is to analyze companies, but before you analyze the company's fundamentals, you should know that which sector you want to put your money into. For example, you are a hedge fund manager or an investment analyst sitting at some of the office in Singapore and you're managing uh, you know, the investments for uh, subcontinent Asia and you know, uh, the Middle East part, probably that's what your role is. Now in such case, you may get funds from let's say uh, your US uh, HO, your US head office sends you funds of $100 million from clients to park your money in, in the subcontinent. Where would you put your money? Are you directly going to pick up a stock? No, you would start more of a top-down approach. A top-down approach is first, you may shortlist the economy, which economy is going to outperform, correct? So randomly, can you pick up, let's say you are an analyst sitting in Singapore or Hong Kong office and which economy will you pick up? What is the basis of that? What will you see? to pick up a particular economy like gdp absolutely the macroeconomic data is like gdp growth rate inflation interest rates and so many factors right those are the factors that you will pick up and you will shortlist an economy for example let's say you shortlisted indian economy you think that indian economy has a good positioning good demographical change you know that mm, there are there is a 60 percent of the population is in the working age and all 60 to 65 percent so that's where there will be a lot of consumption. Now, in that economy, you will then shortlist the sectors, which are the sectors which are expected to outperform. Within those sectors, you will find various industries. And from those industries, you will try to pick up the ones which you feel have potential outperformance uh, you know, aspect. And within that industry, then you will shortlist the companies based on the fundamental valuation that you are aware. Correct? So this is how the top-down approach would work for an analyst uh, who, who wants to park the foreign investments in a particular country. Clear? So the primary steps, you know, apart from economic research is analyzing and understanding the sectors in the industry, right? Before you go to the final step of company valuation. Now, company valuation, the fundamentals, we know the company valuation, how to do the valuation. We have a topic for valuation, which we will understand P-based valuation, discounting cash flow valuation and asset-based valuation. So those are related to company. But before I reach to that company shortlisting, I should shortlist these sectors on the industry, right? Which sectors and which industry will outperform. Now, there is a clear cut definition of what is a sector and what is an industry. Now, people used it interchangeably so as i said since there is no clear definition some people call a thing as a sector and some people call a thing as an industry but broadly what is a sector and what is industry let's discuss that so what do you think is a broader term what do you sector think? sector honestly i i was very surprised 
uh, before I read this in during my time, I always thought that the industry is bigger than a sector. But then I read it and I understood, no, 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 I'm probably thinking it the opposite way. So sector is, is a large section of the economy, which is made up of various industries. And those industries are nothing but various type of business activity in a particular sector. Okay. So our entire economy is, is broken into various sectors within those sectors, based on variety of activities, those sectors are made up of various industries clear. Right. So mm -hmm. what you see on your screen that sector is a large section of the economy industry is more specific group focused on activities, business activities within the sector, right? So here is an example I've given FMCG, fast moving consumer goods. That's the, that's a sector. And in within that sector, what are the sections of the industry? Food and beverages, healthcare, personal care. These are various industries. These are various business activities, which constitute, constitute, constitute a sector. Is that clear? Everyone? Yes. Same way I've put a financial sector. So financial sector is a broad category within which you have banks, credit card, insurance companies, mutual fund companies, portfolio management, and everything that you are aware about finance. So all these different types of business activity are industry and they constitute a sector, which is what we call as a financial sector. Correct. Same way goes with defense sector where I put ammunitions and missiles. So you have uh, companies which produce missiles, supersonic missiles and all. Then you have avionics. These are the companies which produce aircraft like Boeing, Lockheed Martin and all, right? Satellites and other technology, specific transport vehicles, naval ships, shipbuildings, aerospace, combat vehicles, artillery, tanks, etc. So these are all different industries producing different things, but for a particular sector called the defense sector. Clear everyone? So these are few of the examples that I've put up here. Now, out of this, we are going to focus more on a particular industry because our company lies in that particular industry and that business activity is going to be our focus. So what is industry analysis? It is an analysis of a specific branch of whether a production or manufacturing company service or a trade. Understanding the industry in which the company operates provides essential framework for company analysis. So as I said, to do company analysis, we need to know the positioning of our company into the industry. Overall, it is useful in number of investment application that makes fundamental analysis. So what is the use of industry analysis? I've shortlisted a few. It helps us understanding the company's business and overall business environment. So we will come to know what is the company selling? What is the company making? What is the company giving as a service, right? Because that's where we will come to know the growth opportunities or because if the sector looks, or, or sorry, if the industry look, first of all, if the sector looks lucrative and in that, if the industry looks very lucrative, then definitely our company's positioning is very good, right? Second, it helps us identify active investment opportunities, right? So we will be able to pick up those industries where we see positive outlook in the future. And accordingly, we will pick up those particular companies. So for example, just for your example, we know that in FMCG right now, in the current situation where we are going through pandemic for the last couple of years, I should now say, the food and beverage, the healthcare and the personal care, I know that this sector is going to be, you know, the focus. And in that personal care sector is going to be, and healthcare sector is going to be more focus, right? And that, that industry will be outperforming all other industries perhaps, correct? So that will tell me that I, I feel the outlook for these industries is positive for few more months or few more years at least. Now, that's what I will come to know when I'm picking up a company that, okay, this industry has the potential. So it helps us identify those opportunities, right? Finally, it helps us identify the portfolio performance attribution. What is performance attribution? Well, when you get returns from a particular stock, when you get returns from a particular stock, there are two things which drives the stock's returns, which are the two things, as I said, the stock's internal factors and the external factors. So, for example, right now, even if the company is not as efficient as it was, 
but if the industry itself is doing great then my company will also do great right so it will just not only tell you whether your company is performing good or bad but it will also tell you what is the reason of your company's performance it will help you identify the attribution the contribution of uh, you know this different segments into your perform a uh, company's returns so it will actually help you analyze whether the return is due to the market booming or due to the company doing good clear so you should not be carried away with the with the uh, company giving you good returns just because that the market is booming correct so since the entire pharma uh, the pharmaceutical industry is moving up does not mean that my company is also great you need to perhaps pick up that what is the real reason behind the company's growth is it because of the industry or is it because of the internal factors or both clear so these are the various uh, features uh, that will uh, you know you realize when you do industry analysis correct yes. now how to perhaps identify within an industry companies which are of similar case so basically uh, you know it's not easy to identify uh, you know similar companies why do i say because uh, many companies look similar but they may not have the same business they may have a very different business model so you know how to exactly shortlist peer groups or how should i exactly shortlist the companies doing the similar business so there are various approaches to do that so approaches to identifying similar companies industry classification attempts to place companies into groups based on their similarities or what we say as commonalities so based on the common things that you do we put them in different groups the three major approaches are products and service supply based on the products and the services that you do second thing is business cycle sensitivities means the risk part and the third is completely based on statistics that is statistical similarities so there are three ways through which you can identify similar companies or i can say companies doing the same business the first is product and the services supplied very easy companies are categorized based on the products and services that they offer a group of companies offering similar products or services are referred to as industry now we have done that example in the previous slide so for example i say global heavy trucks light vehicles or you know auto parts they are all the part of which industry auto industry got my point so whichever uh, you know a product you whichever type of vehicle you sell or produce or manufacture they are all part of auto industry but within that industry also we a lot of times classify into sub industry that these are heavy vehicles light vehicles and so on correct for example volkswagen uh, oh, sorry volvo has a, a different section for heavy vehicles they they uh, they sell buses and trucks right but they also sell cars and in that also they have luxury cars and all right so they have different uh, within the industry they have several sub industries also clear but they are all part of the broad industry which is what we call as auto industry clear now these industries very important thing industries that are related to each other are grouped to form a sector so for example auto industry and there is another thing called auto ancillary industry auto ancillary is what is auto ancillary auto industry and auto ancillary industry those are the companies which make parts of the auto companies right like like you can say engines you can say tires uh you can say uh, what what else you can say uh, you can say about uh, you know the the companies which do paintings of the auto companies right or the paintings of the cars so these are auto ancillaries so various industries related to the same business are clubbed together and then they become a sector so for example in the previous slide i did show you all that you know companies having somewhat similar business like banks credit card and insurance they all together become a financial sector so various industries are clubbed together to become a sector right 
Now, very important thing, systems that are grouped by products and services usually use a form's principal business activity. Now, these days, companies are doing various businesses. For example, today, tell me every one year, what is Reliance Industries' primary business? Oil. It's still oil and gas refining, right? Yes. But it is also into retail. It is also into telecom and so many various activities. So, we don't say Reliance Industries is a retail company yet because its primary business, its major revenue or profit still uh, would be coming from coming from oil and gas sector. Of course, that is about to change in the in the couple of years where the company is shifting the focus from one end to another and or the company may split its business. That's the right thing for the company to happen, right? But the conclusion is that we are always going to keep companies in a particular industry based on their primary business. Okay. Based on their primary business. Primary business is the one which gives the largest, which has the largest proportion in terms of revenue or profit or business unit. That's, that's how we classify a company into. These days, remember, companies don't do only one business. They do multi-businesses. So, uh, for example, Amazon. Amazon's most of its revenues do come from e-commerce, right? Retail. However, Amazon is also into AWS, Amazon Web Services and all, which, which is going to be like, which is already and going to be a boom. Probably in the later part of the years, you may see Amazon driving more profits from AWS than its retail business. But as of now, still, I will not say Amazon is a fintech. I would say Amazon is more of a retail aggregator. Correct? Even TCS. Sorry? TCS. TCS is a full-fledged IT solution company. So no, but like it still has a different, um, like a business structure. Like? Like, like Tata, um, like Tata Sky, you can say. Like it, it is, um, it has various branches. Uh, Tata Sky? I don't think so. It's part of TCS. They they are all no? part of Tata Telecom, I think. They are all different segment. I think TCS is completely into IT and IT solutions. But like Tata is a... Um... Oh, Tata is a group. We can say it's into 70 to 80 businesses probably, I think. But uh, yes, so of course, Tata is into steel tata is into motor vehicle motors yes everything so here we are not talking about the group of the companies we are talking about the specific company uh, and, yeah but hmm. yeah but like suppose for example like if we are taking this company hmm. uh, like tata so hmm. we we won't able to uh, like distinguish in particular which industry it is right no we we never take tata as a group company no for our analysis because for mm -hmm. me, that group company that is Tata Sons is never going to be part of my investment. I, I will rather focus on an India because Tata Sons is up almost like investing in an economy because it, it has so many companies. So many companies, and yes. Not all companies are performing good. So no one ever invests in, you know, a company which has 70 to 80 business and all the businesses. They may pick up those business of the companies which are doing really great or which has enough potential. Okay. So okay. I may pick up Tata Steel, but not Tata Motors. I may pick up uh, Tata Telecom, but not TCS. So that depends. Again, before I shortlisting the company, I said you that our focus is primarily going to be on the industry and the sector. So if I feel okay. that the steel industry mm -hmm. is going to perform better, that's why I'm investing in Tata Steel. Not because I want to invest in Tata. Yeah, yeah, I got it now. Yes. So my primary focus is going to be that's what we are learning here. The, our primary mm -hmm. focus is going to be the potential in the industry. And then within that industry, you may pick up whichever company. Pick you up there. Okay. Clear. Yes. Now, what we are trying to understand here that in that industry, how would you find similar companies? So our, we will pick up those companies which are doing similar business. So if I'm picking up steel, so I will have Tata Steel whose primary business is steel, 
I will have SR Steel, whose primary business is steel. I'll have uh, uh, the other steel companies where major part of their business is steel, even though they may be doing some other businesses also. Correct? Yes. But majorly that should be steel. That's okay. what. Uh, that's how we will classify companies based on products or services. Okay. Because as I said, these days, not companies do only one business. They may do various other activities. So we'll focus on their primary business and then club them into one particular section. Okay. Okay. So the first, the first classification of, uh, you know, similar companies or peer groups happens based on the cases of products or the services that they do. Right. The second is the riskiness. That is a sensitivity of business cycles. Now here we are going to segregate companies based on cyclical and non-cyclical. Now you, you hear this word quite often when you go in the industry as an analyst and so on. So these two broad classifications, cyclical and non-cyclical companies that will help us com classify companies based on business cycle. So cyclical companies means they, uh, they move with the cycle of the economy. So they are very much highly correlated with what happens in the economy. Correct. So they are vulnerable to market more than the non-cyclical forms. For example, automobile, right? If the industry, if the, if the, if the, uh, if the country is into, uh, you know, a growth cycle overall, or if the sector is into growth cycle, then people will consume more. People will buy cars more. People will buy bikes more. Correct. For example, in country like India now, or even in China, when people are moving from lower income to middle income and high income group, you see more of sales from initially we were focused to 100cc motorcycles. Now there is enormous amount of sales of 300 and 400 cc motorcycles. Are you getting my point? So that's a tactic, huge, huge, huge shift in the, uh, in the people's, uh, you know, spending and all those aspects. So if the economy is doing great. These sectors will do good. Automobiles, industrial, people will buy more houses and so on. Cements and all these sectors will outperform. All these industries will outperform. Those are called cyclical uh, stocks or those are called cyclical companies. Clear? These companies use high operating leverage. What is operating leverage? You are aware about it, right? Operating leverage is there are two types of leverages, operating and financial leverage. Operating leverage is more of using fixed cost or variable cost in your business. Fixed cost. Fixed cost. That's called operating leverage. So the two broad classifications, cyclical stocks and non-cyclical. Non-cyclical have perhaps got nothing to do with the economy. They will perform even if the economy is not doing great. For example, FMCG is said to be a, a non-cyclical or we generally say them as defensive stocks. Non-cyclical are also called as defensive stocks. Why? Because this is a segment like FMCG, utilities, healthcare. These are the segments which will perform even when the cycle of the economy is not that great. Even if there is no growth. These sectors may not be affected because these are more of necessities. Correct? Everyone? Yes. So these sectors will hardly perform. That's why you will find all the fund managers in the world having defensive stocks or non-cyclical stocks in their portfolio for sure. So you will have people in their portfolios, stocks like uh, those who sell FMCG products, maybe Johnson & Johnson, or maybe, uh, you know, stocks like, uh, which one you can say, Heinz Ketchup stock. So uh, these are the stocks that you will always find in people's portfolio because they are less risky. They are, they are called non-cyclical stocks. Correct? So the second classification of company grouping the companies uh, is based on the cycle, uh, the business cycle, right? Or the business sensitivity. The problem with business sensitivity are two problems. First of all, the business cycle continuously keeps on changing. So, you, you know, one company may be into a growth cycle then uh, the other company or other section may not be into that cycle. So it's, it's a very, I should say, non-stable kind of a movement. That's what the first problem with business cycle is. Second, suppose a company is a conglomerate and a diversified uh, or, or it's, it's a global company. 
for example tesla sells cars to all over the world right so there is a high possibility that tesla may face uh, growth in its india and china market but may fail a, may face a, a recession or a you know downside or, or a decline in the european market so even that's possible so you can't conclude that a company is right now cyclical or not because the cycles are different in different countries so global company can experience economic expansion in one part of the world while experiencing recession in the other part clear so these are the two potential problems with the business cycle sensitivities clear yes and the third and the last type of uh, you know approach to identify similar companies is based on statistics so we generally see based on correlation correlation is the statistics which we use to identify companies having same risk isn't it what is correlation it tells us that how the two companies move in tandem with respect yes. to the economy right so we 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 calculate correlation which is based on covariance and covariance is based on the standard deviation and so standard on standard deviation so statistical approach to group companies are typically based on correlations of the past right the technique that they use here is called as cluster analysis analysis cluster means first of all you make clusters your groups now in the, in a particular group you'll have all the companies which have high correlation okay but the relation between the groups has to be low are you getting my point so the relation between the clusters should be high or low very low and in a particular cluster the relation between the companies should be very high are you getting my point so cluster analysis is a point where you know uh, the firms have high correlation within themselves in a particular cluster but the clusters have a very low correlation with themselves okay so for example i have created a cluster uh, which is about auto companies so if within that all the companies will have high correlation but then the second cluster is of uh, healthcare companies so between healthcare and auto the correlation should be very low otherwise you will find the same correlation then why why are you having different clusters are you getting my point so the conclusion there should be very low correlation between clusters between cluster or the groups but within the groups whatever companies you have they should be high highly correlated clear yes the problem with statistical methods is that there is no guarantee that the past will repeat in the future the relationship may be absolutely random it may be by chance and it's just a statistical answer it may not be economically significant that's the problem with all the statistics by the way right so there are three prominent approaches to identify companies based on a particular group or a particular section and those are product based on product or the services that they do second based on the business cycle sensitivities and third is based on statistics these are the only three ways through which you group companies and then do the analysis correct now who does this by the way who helps us uh, who tells us that you know this is a particular industry or this is a particular sector is it is it a random or do we do that based on something who's going to tell you that this is uh you know uh, this is fmcg sector or this is defense sector or this is a pharmaceutical sector how would people know that any idea well as i said there is no clear definition for it right these things comes with experience these things come with the trend that you see around right so there are now there are now some classifications official classifications which which will try to make it simple for us to classify between different industries and sectors so well designed industry classification is very important for us to do the company analysis it allows us to compare the trends and helps us derive the valuations and helps us find various components of the 
growth of the companies. So the two main providers of the classification are commercial classification and government classification. They both will help us classify the industry. So commercial industry classification system and government industry classification system, both are there in the market based on which, I mean, all the analysts see this classification and based on that, they become later on a sector or an industry expert. Do you, do you uh, know a fact that a research analyst in in the longer period of time is not going to be an analyst for all the sectors are you aware about that yes at one point of time you will have to be initially you may you may probably, yes initially you may be doing uh, you may try, be trying to analyze maybe various sectors during your training period and so on but later on you'll have to be an expert of a particular industry or a sector am i correct right yes so then you should be able to uh, be able to classify that okay this is a particular industry or this is a particular sector now most of the analysts most of the analysts do follow commercial classification although there are government classifications also but we will realize we will see the points why government classifications are not more used which is very obvious because of the government not updating its data we'll see about that but first, we will understand what are the famous commercial classifications in the overall industry. So classification of companies in equity indices is done through industry groupings. You're going to club various industries, starting at the broadest level with a general sector grouping and then narrowly into sub-industries. So there are three famous commercial classifications. I'm talking about global commercial classification. The first is GICS, which is Global Industry. Uh, standard global industry classification standard. It is developed by SNP and MSCI, Standard and Poor and Morgan Stanley Composite Index. Right? It has a four tier classifications where there are sectors. Then within the sectors you have industry. Within those industries you have uh, within those industry groups basically they say. Within those industry group you have industries and in that industries you have sub industries. So that's the outlook. So they have the, uh, by the way, uh, meaning also of what is a sector, what is an industry group, and in that industry group, what is an industry. I'll show you that. I've provided the link also here, so you can also check it, but I'll show you that in a while. Then the other famous is Russell Global Sectors, which is also called as FTSC Russell, developed by FTSC Russell. Instead of four, they have a three-tier classification, sectors, subsectors, and industries. And then there is ICB, Industries Classification Benchmark, which is also developed by Dow Jones and FTSE. So, which is also actually a part of FT Russell, by the way. They have a four-tier classification like GICS. So, they also they, they have different names. They call it subsectors, uh, super sectors, sorry, super sectors, sectors, and then subsectors. And within those subsectors, they have industries. Of course, you don't have to remember all these numbers. Okay, don't worry. You don't have to remember all these numbers at all. They're never going to ask you the exact figure because that keeps on changing. So by that, uh, when they had published in the book, they had probably 157 in sub industries. Now they have 158 sub industries. So you don't have to remember. You just need to be aware that, oh, there are some commercial classifications. I'll show you a small, uh, you know, part of it if possible. Let me show you. Is my screen visible? Let me know. Yes. So this is the GICS classification. Okay. Now, if you go to this website in the GICS classification, they have sectors. For example, let, let me select energy sector. So within the sector, I have industry group. So I have energy equipment and services. And when I will, uh, uh, so within that industry group, there are various industries. So energy group uh, equipments and oil and gas consumables. So in that way, you will probably go, when you go in detail, you'll find sectors, industry group and in that industry. So for example, consumer discretionary in that you have automobiles, consumer service, retailing. So let me click retailing. So within retailing, then you'll have several industries. Okay. Then you have specialty retail distributors and so on. So in that way you can click it and then probably you can shortlist the companies that you want. So mostly analysts do the, this is what I, I call filtering. They filter. 
which sector they want to focus on within that sector what industry group that they want to focus on in that industry group what are the various industries and within that industry what are the companies that i want to focus into got it everyone yes now so some of the examples i will tell you of the sectors now now you saw your let me show you again you saw your healthcare materials industries financials and so on right so some of the examples i will discuss here are basic materials and processing it means all about basic materials and processing this sector does what type of activities building materials like cements chemicals forest products packaging metals minerals and so on that is basic materials and processing they are all used for making or producing or manufacturing something correct consumer discretionary which we just saw there automotive apparel hotels restaurant business consumer staples these are these are mostly perishable things like food beverages tobacco and personal product care products energy which we are all, all aware about exploration production or refining of oil and gas financials completely aware about banking financial and insurance healthcare healthcare includes manufacturers of medicine the pharmaceutical biotech medical devices very big business healthcare equipments medical supplies and so on industrial produ uh, or producer durables these are those who produce capital goods or equipments basically machines right heavy machines including um, those making aeroplanes are also a part of industrial or producible durables real estate those companies doing engaged in the business of uh, you know real estate like those who do projects those who construct buildings those who construct hotels everyone technology uh, and by the way real estate also includes reits they are also the part of real estate right real estate investment trusts like etf of real estate technology will be of all related to it which is hardware and software both computers semiconductors uh internet services technology consulting like tcs what we discuss all that telecom telecom so fixed and wireless uh networking that is the telecom sector by the way telecom is also a part of utility utility are are you know your your supplies of electric gas water supplies and telecom so telecom is used as a separate section also and telecom is also a part of your utility so these are just some of the ways for you to understand what are the sectors and in that sectors what are the business activities so based on that then you can classify the industry clear again i'll repeat you don't have to remember it but once you become an analyst you should be able to classify companies based on you know this activities so all those companies who are going to do automotive apparel hotel restaurant business they will be all part of consumer discretionary now when you enter into the industry as a research analyst mostly you'll be using these words that let me invest in healthcare sector so in healthcare sector what are the industries what are the business activities that they do that's how you'll come to know here clear so commercial classifications helps you this type of represent they give you this type of representation through which you can identify which sections of the companies you or, or which sector of the economy you want to invest into right now then the classification is also provided by government commercially these companies are actively doing it but governments also provide you classification definitely what would you more recommend commercial classification not government right there are government agencies national agencies which do the classification especially in us and australia and new zealand and north america they do have their own classifications again you don't have to remember them you just can go through these names but what do you think analysts would be looking at more of commercial or government classification commercial definitely commercial classification why because government classification very first practically i'll say it is not updated regularly many government classifications like uh, the one year north america industry classification as per as i'm aware they update every 5 years so they update their uh, you know classification every 5 years which is very very long i should say which is very very outdated because the industry is changing so rapidly so that's the first and the biggest problem that i feel second 
most government systems do not disclose the information about the constituents so when the government tells me that this is the industry but within that industry what are the companies they don't disclose that so they don't give us full information like the commercial third they don't distinguish between companies which are large and small companies which are doing it for profit companies which are doing for social they don't distinguish between that they just club all the companies so that's not what i want i want commercial companies and for profit making companies i want a separate section for small companies for large companies within the industry so that i can pick up those companies right so that's the thing that i would want in more detail but government classification does not provide that and finally commercial classification does include publicly traded companies but government classification will also include those companies which are not publicly traded they may be privately traded so that's not of more of a use for me if i can't buy a stake in that company right so there are various advantages of commercial classification and that's why people use that more rather than using industry uh, the government classification right remember these are the two ways for us to get us uh, the you know idea of what a particular sector or industry consists of okay over the period when you are doing it repetitively and everyone is following the same then that becomes an industry norm so today as i said there is no definition for what is an industry or a sector but because of the few commercial classification followed by everyone that has now become the norm clear everyone yeah. so quickly tell me what are the cyclical and non cyclical companies we just discussed about it right cyclical and non cyclical companies non cyclical are necessities yes and cyclicals are very much uh, correlated with the business cycles or with the economy business right? cycle business cycles yes so now we are trying to understand what are the factors that affect the sensitivity of a company well we have already discussed that cyclical and non cyclical let's discuss it in more detail a bit so the basic feature of cyclical companies are they are heavily dependent or correlated with the business cycle they are highly volatile very risky and they have high operating leverage as we discussed they are expensive and non necessities so if they are non necessities and if the prices are too high will people buy them or will people delay that well they will delay it they can delay it that's the reason why when the economy is not performing when the inflation is very high people may delay buying of cars when the petrol prices are too high people may not buy cars people may not buy vehicles right so that's the reason why cyclical firms are affected the most when the economy is going through a bad or uh, uh, economy is going through a poor business cycle clear so the products whose purchases can be delayed until the economy improves so for example travel luxury travel that is going to be a part of cyclical business cruise they are going to be part of cyclical business people will not spend if the economy is not doing great when they are, the economy is doing great when they are getting good income they will spend heavily into that so basic materials and processing consumer discretionary energy financial services industrial and producer durables and technology are all part of cyclical forms clear peak companies and individuals spend more in efficiency and all those things when the economic cycle is doing great non cyclical firms as i said their uh, their demand is relatively stable they are i can say less elastic to price you understand elasticity they when the prices yes. the demands change drastically they are less sensitive they are less elastic to the price so they have less volatility because they are necessities like healthcare utilities telecoms and so on now within those non cyclical we basically as i said non cyclical is what we said defensive but in that non cyclical also we have defensive and growth defensive are the ones which are the extreme non cyclical means they are least affected by the stage of the business cycle so they are they are extreme necessities like utilities so whatever happens to the economy you are not going to stop consuming power you are not going to stop consuming your basic needs consumable staples like food and basic services like medicines and so on they are not going to be affected at all 
by the level of the business by the level of the uh, by the stage of the business cycle clear yes. but within that non cyclical you have some growth industries for example they have demand so strong that they are largely affected by the stage of cycle so they they are defensive but that's because of the quantum of their uh, you know demand can you tell me what under non cyclical what are the type of uh, you know sectors which you will feel are like growth industries i'll repeat the feature that they have mentioned that they have demand so strong that they are largely affected by the stage of business cycle anyone non cyclical firms but with growth industries any idea so huge demand that uh, it doesn't matter where the economy is but you will continuously uh, use them any idea food food mm uh for example i will tell you uh, internet service their internet service is in so much of a demand uh and of course supplied by very few companies limited companies because of the high entry barriers which we will see now in the later slides but the internet demand is so high that uh you know even if the economy is doing good or bad that demand will stay constant or will keep on growing always so the amount of data we consume that has got perhaps nothing to do with what's happening in the economy okay so there's always going to be very very extreme high demand of internet usage clear so here the demand is so high always and it's going to be high always that you know it doesn't matter your that what uh, what stage of business cycle the company is into clear yes so utilities will not be included in growth it will be uh, but see uh, utilities are as investment in utility companies they have a, a see many of the utility companies are by the way regulated tightly for example in our country also the rate of uh, electric utility is decided by the government or capped by the government right for at, at least for non commercial purpose okay so utility companies don't do bad performance or don't do extreme great performance because most of the time their profits are capped their prices are fixed okay for in case for for our country like india even it's the regulated more oil marketing companies are regulated of course now they are deregulated but they can't charge the price that they want mm -hmm. okay. so they are very stable as such they are very like you are aware that when i invest in a utility company in india i am going to get 10% fixed dividend every year so these are also called high dividend yield stocks so they are defensive company so they are constantly going to get dividend even if the companies and the company's performance you won't see any volatility there right so the the demand is actually constant it's not that great it, it's more or less the you know the utility of your electricity is is generally constant okay all of sudden you don't start using too much of electricity and all it's it's generally very fixed but as i said the demand for internet is just increasing from 4g to 5g and so on so it's ever increasing and it's probably going to increase more in the future so that demand will always overpower everything okay that's what i believe so they they can be said as part of the growth industry correct yes now why are we doing all this discussion about cyclical non cyclical firms industry classification well be because the most important thing is that when you do company analysis you are are you only going to research about your company for example i have shortlisted a pharmaceutical company like pfizer i feel wow pfizer has the best chance right now to make profits but do you think uh, you will only research about pfizer 
and conclude whether to invest or not no what else will you also look at its competitors yes that's called peer group so you need to exactly identify appropriate uh, competitors that's what is called as constructing a peer group so constructing a peer group is you know identifying those companies which are engaged in the similar business and whose valuation metrics are influenced by the same factors the construction of a peer group however is a subjective process and often differ significantly uh, because of you know different categories or because of different classifications and many times because of the analysts perceptions that they feel that this is not an appropriate competitor for example i feel now i can't compare reliance industries with ongc or with exxon mobil because reliance industries is in do multiple business unless reliance splits its business i can't compare that so now when reliance has huge component of its business coming from telecom i can't even say it's a telecom company because it it has other business also attached to it got my point so it it is a very subjective process whether you still consider reliance as a oil company or a telecom company and so on correct mostly the right thing i don't know what reliance is waiting for i have no idea why are they not splitting up the company they should do that india's largest company asia's richest person i don't know what's stopping them i mean maybe i have lack of knowledge i can say but i don't know what's stopping them from splitting the business when they have this three huge businesses in one group and they are all completely unrelated you would see retail is a very different business from oil and gas telecom is a different business so they should split that right so so compare so you need to compare apple to apple so that peer group comparison is very essential part of company analysis now they have said as a, as i repeat they have said that it's a subjective process but they have given some guidance here so they have given some steps and some questions that you should ask before you conclude that this is the peer group this is the peer group so what are the steps that they have recommended they have they have the steps that they have recommended is the first that examine commercial classification so if you have commercial or government classification out of that if you have commercial classification use that as a starting point well most of the time you will get your answer from that itself then also look out at the company's financial reports when well, many times in the financial reports the companies just not don't give they just don't give the numbers they also tell you that oh what is our business what are we into exactly they explain that so review the company's annual reports for discussion of the competitive environment then they will for example i when i was ipo analyst we we used to get this red herring prospectus which i call as form s1 right that the companies file before the ipo so in that there was a section where uh, where the regulators had told the company to explain what are your what what are your comparables what are the competitors right now into the business that you are doing so who better to tell us that uh, than the company itself that who are the companies doing similar businesses right so it was com- compulsory for all the companies to shortlist their peer groups okay now many times they may not be exactly doing the business for for example when facebook launched its ipo it was very difficult for facebook to tell who are my competitors are you getting it because they were not exact competitors clear but many times it is the company itself in its disclosure they have to show that who are their peer groups so you get a very very you know handy information from the company's financial statement itself then also check out the competitors financial statements are they also doing the same business whether their business and the existing company's business is similar the product that they sell or the service that they give the primary service that they give is it somewhat similar or not right so you should also look at the competitors annual reports to identify such things then look out at trade publications magazines and various other resources from where like you have bloomberg and reuters from where you get all this data that who are the common company so if the industry is following a trend do pick up that and finally confirm that each company derives a significant portion of its revenue or business operations from the similar business activity so i will say that 
you know, when I'm shortlisting one company and comparing with another company, they, their both primary business or major portion of their revenue or profit should come from the similar business. Then I will put them in a peer group or else not. Clear? Those are the steps that you will take into consideration while preparing a competitor's group or a peer group. Clear? Everyone? And then you will ask few questions. What are the questions that you should ask before you conclude that this is my peer group, right? So some questions that you should ask, as I said, the first is the proportion of revenue. So the higher the proportion of revenue, you know, uh, comes from the primary business of both the companies, the more likelihood is that they both will be a part of a peer group, right? So what proportion of revenue and operating profit is derived from the business activity similar to, the, uh, to that of the subject company? So all the companies in the peer group should have major part of their business, high proportion of their business coming from the similar, similar activity. Does potential peer company face a demand environment similar to that of the subject company? So are you also going to face the same risk parameters? Are you also going to face the same growth potentials, growth margins, and so on? So will I use the same valuation fundamentals for both the companies? Or will, the both, will both the companies be affected by the same cycle, by the same uh, you know, growth factors? Right? Then probably my classification is correct. Does a potential company have a finance subsidiary? Now, this is very interesting. Now, for example, uh, you know, most of the car companies, most of the car companies, are you aware that they also have their finance subsidiaries? Yes. Why? So that they can help people with the credit yeah. for with their the car. Credit. Now, likewise, uh, if, if a comp and then many of these companies, they also have their insurance arm to provide insurance for the cars and all. So if a company has a lot of subsidiaries, right, then, then probably it is going to be affected. Uh, uh, then, then, you know, when you're doing a peer comparison, then you have to take this into consideration because you'll have to do a lot of adjustments uh, to, to lower down this effect of the help from the subsidiary because your subsidiaries are also boosting your business. For example, e-commerce companies, they buy and sell products. They, the vendors sell the products, right? On the platform. And then they sell it to the customers, but they deliver it to customers. So most of the e-commerce e companies, they have their own delivery arms. They, they don't deliver it everything through FedEx or DHL, right? Most of the e-commerce companies have their own delivery system, delivery mechanism. And now they have floated that as a separate entity. For example, Flipkart in India has its own, has its own delivery system called e-cart. Correct? So, in that way, those subsidiaries are going to help the company a lot. So you will have to make an adjustment when you're going to compare Flipkart with, uh, let's say, uh, with Amazon. Amazon now also has its own delivery system, but Amazon also delivers through other modes. Correct. So you need to make adjustments to the financial statements to lessen the impact of subsidiaries. So you will have to probably exclude them if the other groups do not have those subsidiaries. So you'll have to take these considerations. You'll have to ask these questions before you conclude on what is a peer group. Clear? Everyone? Any questions till now? Um, so for Reliance Industry, for example, mm. if we want to compare as a in a peer group, Right. As you said that it, it is already diversified, like it yes. has into so mm. many businesses. Mm. Uh, so what subsidiary should we like exclude while comparing? Uh, well, you it's very difficult for you to exclude from the existing financial statements. Mm -hmm. However, uh, they do prepare uh, group wise financial statements and consolidated financial statements. Okay. So if I, uh, as of now, Unless the company splits its business, I, I may probably, it's a very, 
a big task for you to you know separate the entire financial statement and uh, then compare it with the other companies because you don't have a separate valuation for those business so let's say tomorrow reliance splits its company into different segments then it is very uh, much right for you to keep them into a peer group right now i would not compare any other oil and gas company with reliance as of now okay i would not put them into the peer group if i were an analyst however see reliance industries is also a very big giant company so keeping it out of the industry uh, or the peer group is also somewhat not right but honestly i would not put into the peer group because of its uh, multiple aspect that's why they say that you know if that is the case you have a lot of subsidiaries then you should probably adjust or exclude them from your primary business that's what they are saying okay now if the subsidiary's business is one third of reliance its main business then it's difficult to exclude then it's at the reliance end where they need to split the company okay so rarely such companies you find but otherwise mostly the companies have a very focused business so as you said uh, about tcs so tcs has just focus into it and it solutions so i know its major business is coming from that so i can very much easily compare tcs with a company like uh, hcl or with another it company infosys. very easily infosys very easily because majorly they do the similar type of business and they don't have enough subsidiaries which do other businesses rarely they do have they are just focus in it so that's very easy way of putting everyone into a peer group it's just just a case with large companies because they are into diversified business so that's where the problem is otherwise mostly it's not a problem with most of the companies correct okay yes any doubts no well so our focus is uh, understanding the uh, our focus is on company valuation and before we reach the valuation or before we finalize on which company we want to invest into or which company we want to analyze we are trying to understand the positioning of that company in the industry uh, what is the growth prospect of the industry okay now your very important factor is that how the overall industry is performing what are the dynamics of the industry that the company is into and what is the level of competition in that industry is it going to be a factor that will hurt the profits of my company or not that's what we are trying to understand right so industries or groups sharing distinct business model or catering to specific market segments in an industry they form strategic grouping so all those companies which have uh, which are catering to a particular market they are grouped together principles of strategic analysis by the way what is strategic analysis strategic analysis is uh, you know an approach where you are trying to identify the factors which are going to drive the industry and uh, the market's competition overall so that's what strategic analysis is you you are trying to identify and you know study those factors now what are the principles of strategic analysis when analyzing an industry the analyst must recognize the economic fundamentals that can change with respect to uh, market for various industries so you'll have to identify those those economic fundamentals which will change your uh, which will change the dynamics of your economy uh, of the industry some industries are very highly competitive right where the players are struggling to survive or generate profits while others are completely dominant and the market is uh, you know completely in their favor so you'll have to pick up those companies those industries now there is something that that is we what, what that is what we call a spread positive and negative spread normally what is the focus that we will invest in companies where the return on investment is greater than the cost of capital well if your return on investment is greater than the cost of capital that's what if you remember from capital budgeting your irr is greater than cost of capital then we say the project is having a positive npv right yes positive npv means it generates value addition for your shareholders it it gives you wealth for the shareholders 
right? So positive spread means those companies whose ROI, return on investment is higher than the cost of capital or IRR greater than VAC. Such companies are called positive spread because they add value to the shareholders, right? Wealth. But compared to them, negative spread are those companies which are not generating enough profits even to pay their capital products, uh, capital providers. These companies are what we call as destroyers of value. They are the ones who destroy the value of the company. So you'll have to identify uh, such companies, spread the spread between these companies uh, whose spread is positive or negative for your evaluation. Now, in order to compete in a marketplace, companies need to understand the dynamics of industry and market in which they operate. And this approach is called strategic analysis. Now, so strategically, you should know that uh, strategically, whether the industry or the company that I'm shortlisting, how competitive is the industry? What is the level of competition in the industry? Will that dominate the company or industry or will it be a struggling industry? That's what I need to know. Now, to identify these factors, a uh, very famous uh, professor from Harvard University, Michael Porter, whose, uh, whose five forces that people use as a framework for, for strategic analysis. So five forces uh, by Michael Porter, which is also called as Porter's uh, five forces, right? It's, it's a very famous theory used in all the management uh, academics and used by all management consultants across the world. They are all aware about it. You will find this in all the books. So Michael Porter has identified five forces framework in his, which is a classical starting point for strategic analysis. And what is it going to help me with? It is going to help me with understanding how intense is the competition. And based on that, I will decide whether to invest in that particular industry or not, right? So he's given the five, uh, you know, factors which will decide the level of competition. The first is the threat of new entrants. New entrants. So tell me one thing. Your 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 answer is going to be that whether it is going to be, uh, you know, increase the competition or reduce the competition. You know, increasing the competition is not going to is is going to have an ill effect on the pricing and profitability right so from the consumer side you always want the competition to be high but from an investor side you always want the competition to be low you want your company to dominate right correct so you will invest in those companies where you want the competition to be relatively low now tell me if there is easy access for new companies to enter into the business is the threat high or low what's the situation if there is easy high. access yes very high threat right if there is easy yes. access for companies to enter however if there are very huge entry barriers for example tell me one thing can i do a startup in uh, you know uh, in producing aeroplanes it's not very easy, yeah. right? Because they are high capital intensive companies, uh, high capital intensive businesses. So there are huge fixed costs in, involved. I mean, starting up a bank, you know, I, I can start up a company on online e-commerce company. I can start up easily. But starting up a bank by an individual like me, it's going to be very, very, very tough. So if the industry that you are focusing on, if that has very high threat of new entrants. It's very easy for them to enter. If there are less barriers, then it is highly competitive, right? But then there are industries where there are so much of barriers that not everyone can enter into it, right? Why? Because of factors like high cost, premium pricing, or economies of scale, which means you will make their, for example, if you enter into the telecom business, you'll have to pay billions of dollars for the spectrum licenses, right? And for covering that huge operating cost, you will have to do enough of spending on marketing and sales and you'll have to generate huge volume. You'll probably have to sell your telecom services to billions of people, right? Millions of people. Only after that, you'll be able to do a break even. So threat of new entrants is a very prominent factor in deciding the competition level. 
Now tell me one thing, steel, oil and gas, aerospace, these are industries where the threat of new entrant is very high or low? High. Very low. Threat of new entrants is low, isn't it? Steel, not everyone can start up a steel company easily. Yes, yes, low. Aerospace. So these are those industries where the threat of new entrant is less. So that's where opportunity is for me. Clear? Yes. The second factor is bargaining power of the supplier. Bargaining power of the supplier. So in this case, if the demand is very high, right, relative to the supply, in a high demand relative to supply market, the suppliers have a strong position and hence greater bargaining power. For example, were very prominent cases of Microsoft. Now, most of the world outside US, you can say most of the world uses computers which are operating on Windows, isn't it? Yes. Now, there is high demand for high demand for computers, but most of those computers use Microsoft as their primary uh, operating system, right? So in a high demand related to supply market, suppliers have a strong position and greater bargaining power. So that's the reason why they dominate the uh, pricing, right? In a computer. For example, in phones, I can say Google now dominates because of its Android positioning. Am I correct? Yes. But of course, companies like Apple, they have their own operating system. So they have now shifted from Intel chips to now they have moved to Avon, their own internal uh, work on the uh, semiconductors, right? So, you know, how strong the suppliers are, if the suppliers are too much dominant, then, then your, your company will be struggling. Your company is very much dependent on them. Why? Because the cost of raw material, labor, your input costs will be very high, isn't it? So if the suppliers have a good bargaining power, is that a uh, is that a positive sign for your investment or negative sign for you for your investments negative negative it's it's a clear disadvantage if the suppliers are very strong so i've given here an example of in the companies i've given the example of microsoft and intel they are ve they are very dominating in terms of they are they are the largest suppliers correct and i've also given the example of countries like i i'd say china is the global supplier so China is such a big supplier that now so many people are dependent on China for everything because of its economies of scale, correct? Because of its low labor cost. So we are heavily dependent on China and China, that's why it dictates many of its policies, correct? Which is what irks countries like US and European countries, clear? Yes. But some countries like Germany, they have a clear advantage in technology because of which they have a very high, uh, you know, uh, I can say a, a bargain. For example, when it comes to technology, uh, you know, machineries and all, you know, a lot of times the German machineries or the Japanese machineries are so efficient that they have a clear advantage compared to the other companies, right? So that's the reason why they, they have very good, uh, you know, bargain power because of their expertise or because of their economies of scale. Clear? Yes. Then comes the bargaining power of the buyers. Again, this is a clear disadvantage. If the buyers are, you know, if they have a strong bargaining power, why? Because they can easily shift from one to another product or because they can, they can switch to another products. So in a market with too many suppliers or high supply relative to demand, buyers tend to have a strong position and hence bargaining power. This force influences the prices that the firm can change cost uh, and uh, with respect to investments. So this forces the companies, you know, to a point where the companies can't dictate the prices. The prices are in the control of the buyers. Now there can be too many buyers to control it or probably there are some significant buyers. For example, in e-commerce, the market is so competitive. The buyers have so many choices. And that's the reason why I say e-commerce is more like a buyer's market. So, you know, everyone rushes to give them huge discounts and lure them because it's, it's more of 
it looks like the e-commerce companies control the market but i say the buyers have got now so many choices that they they have a more bargaining power here right because they will easily you know switch buying an apple phone from you know they have an option now to buy from the store they have now an option to buy from amazon they have now an option to buy from so many other sources so now buyers have more power in their hand if you are in that industry where the buyer has more power then it's a clear disadvantage correct for example i have also mentioned here some buyers have a, a very uh, you know uh, authoritative power like governments as of now in case of vaccines right the government can come up at any time and say that we are not going to increase the cost of the vaccine this is the maximum that you can have governments have the right they they have the power that they can control patents on many vaccines right so if the buyers are uh, having a high advantage a uh, high authoritative power compared to the company then that's a clear disadvantage clear yes right. then comes the threat of substitutes yes substitutes can limit profitability the threat of substitute is high if the buyers can easily switch from from one product to another product it's not going to hamper them a lot this is very evident in fmcg for example i have given here the example of washing powder well many people they just you know in such cases the price is a very big factor for people who use it daily right of course i don't completely deny that quality or habits or your usability over the period does make a, a difference for example when i say toothpaste you don't change the toothpaste because the prices are cheaper you you keep the you know consumption of a particular toothpaste which you have been using since long for a long period right you you don't switch it easily however there are some products like i said washing powder here you will you will switch easily from one to another if the price you know because you can easily substitute that that's not going to be such a big impact for you correct in the same way i have put up the cab services here so i in india have an option of ola and uber you know it's very easy for me to just switch from one to another there's not a clear difference between their service most of the services are same the food take away business services it's very same so when i see a company like zomato or uh, uber eats i i see where the charges are lesser and who's going to deliver me easily i don't mind whoever delivers me correct so it's very easy for you to switch from one product to another one company to another company then that's a clear disadvantage for your business clear and finally the intensity of the rivalry if the peer groups are in a very fierce battle to win the market share then it's a clear disadvantage to your company on the contrary if there is a cartel form like oligopoly market where let's say pepsi and coke have decided that they'll now spend less on marketing and uh, compared to what they were heavily spending on marketing and brand ambassadors uh, a decade back now they are not spending enough now do you see pepsi and coke having a uh, huge spending on commercials i see that has been reduced substantially from what it was 10 years back correct Now just imagine ten years back you had the world's best celebrities endorsing Pepsi and Coke, right? All celebrities. You name me any celebrities, they were endorsing Pepsi and Coke, isn't it? A, yes. A couple of years back. Now you see, all of a sudden, most of the big celebrities have stopped, uh, or, or the companies have stopped using too much of celebrities uh, for endorsing their products, right? so that's what they have probably formed a cartel that they are not going to overspend because they are the only few players but if the rivalry is intense if both are if many companies are fighting for that share if the competition level is intense then it's a problem competition level between the existing players can determine pricing strategy and profitability greater concentration and market fragmentation greater concentration means there are very few firms and they have a huge market share as i said pepsi and coke correct telecom few companies huge market share tell me one thing if there is a greater concentration if the market is dominated by few players will the competition be healthy or fierce compared compared that to market fragmentation what is market fragmentation 
means there are too many companies having small share. What do you think is, is more of an advantage from the company point of view? Having a concentrated market or a fragmented market? Concentrated market. Concentrated market, right? So you have to deal with less number of people. So there will be probably, I, I, as I said, cartels can be formed, which can be, of course, uh, challenged by the competition authorities, but the cartels can be formed, right? So if, there is, if the market is concentrated, like I've given your auto industry and telecom, telecom especially is a section where you have few players having huge market share. That's They have a clear advantage compared to retail market, which is very fragmented. So there are so many players in the retail segment having small, small share, correct? For example, clothing, there are so many brands and not every, not a, a particular brand has a dominance in clothing, isn't it? In retail also now you have so many options for retail, correct? It's not only one clear option. So then in such a case, I will say that too many players with small share, that's a fragmented market and that's going to be very intense competitive correct so the rivalry there will be intense so five factors threat of new entrants now you have to answer me you have to answer me that what will cause more competition okay threat of new entrants will uh, easy access to new entrants cause more competition yes or no easy access to new entrants, which means less barriers will increase the competition, correct? Yes. Bargaining power of suppliers, if the suppliers dominate the market, then it's going to be disadvantage to you. Then it's going to be uh, the company's, uh, you know, competitive strength will reduce. If the buyers have a bargaining power, if the buyers uh, will, uh, you know, decide what the market should be, then that's a, again, disadvantage. That's yeah. that's not a healthy, uh, that's going to be very competitive for the company. The fourth is a threat of substitutes. If the customers can switch from your product to any other product easily, then again, it's a disadvantage. Then that's a increased threat of competition. And finally, if the rivalry is intense between the players, between the competitors, then of course the competition will increase and reduce the profitability. So you will always consider these five factors before you decide about the uh, the industry's future and that's where you will probably decide where is the potential so you would want these five factors to be controlled so that there's an enough opportunity for the company Clear? this is what is known as michael's uh, five forces michael porter's five forces correct okay now after you have decided that, let's say here, you have decided that based on your strategic analysis and based on the Porter's five forces analysis, you decided that, oh, there is very less uh, scope, you know, of new entrants, the market is less competitive there, the buyer or the supplier control is not enough, right? There is less threat of substitutes. For example, you are uh, making a very unique product like uh, aerospace. For example, you are making aeroplanes like Boeing or uh, Airbus, correct? Now, this is a very niche segment of uh, the industry where you won't find too many players producing aeroplanes, correct? Globally, there are very few players who produce commercial aeroplanes, right? Well, there are many companies who produce fighter jets because every country has their own defense uh, unit producing fighter jets. But very few, most of the companies in the airplane, they have two types of airplanes, either Boeing, from the Boeing or from the Airbus, right? Boeing based from US and Airbus based from Europe, Germany, correct? Now, let's say I have shortlisted the aerospace industry and my focus is because there are very few players, the market is competitive and uh, relatively these it's a, it's a more concentrated market. And I feel that uh, this is where the potential is. But right now in this time of pandemic, does it make sense even if the company has all the strategic advantage here, does it make sense for me to invest in a Boeing or an Airbus now? No. 
why because right now like uh, the also, industry is affected yes go ahead yeah the industry is affected uh, like as it is the overall uh, economy is not doing well so right. so it also matters the timing right yes that basically what i'm trying to say it matters at what stage of business cycle you are into right now we are not at that business cycle where it makes sense for us to invest in the aerospace industry correct so after analyzing all the factor what also matters is what we call as industry life cycle where exactly the industry is right now positioned that's what we need to know before we put our you know horses in that particular industry are you getting it so even if all the environment is conducive for me to invest in a particular industry but what also matters is where exactly right now the industry is placed that is called industry life cycle industries like individual companies tend to evolve over time and usually experience significant changes in the rate of growth and profitability during the their life right over the period an industry passes through various stages and uh, an industry stage in a cycle they have said that has an impact on the competition growth and profits as i said therefore it is very essential for me to know where exactly the industry is positioned as of now correct now that's going to be a very important part of your strategic analysis you can't just put your money because you think that the industry is having a conducive potential but you also need to see where right now in the life cycle you are so this is a typical life cycle of an industry what do you see the curve it moves up and then it saturates correct yes so there are five general stages of an industry life cycle first is the embryonic stage which is the initial stage which is also called the i, I call it as a startup stage for any industry then there is a growth stage where the company or where the, the entire industry is growing very fast at a very fast rate then there is a shake out stage where you know the growth tries to shake out and there is a potential that you know the growth may the may, may peak out finally it peaks out that's called a mature stage after which the industry's growth tends to fall and then it keeps on happening the same after there's a decline then there's again a growth stage and so on and on right so the industry generally goes through this life cycle over its period now before i read out what are the uh, you know features at a particular stage tell me one thing right now just just a random thing okay we'll discuss about that right now this aerospace industry is at which point right now the aerospace industry is it is, is it at an embryon embryonic stage is it at an initial no. stage no is it at a growth stage means it no. is rapidly increasing of course not no is it at a shake out stage where the growth is slowing the profits are declining uh, declining perhaps not i think this stage no. is past yes a couple of years back i would have said that it was at a mature stage where there are very few players the industry is uh, you know more concentrated there is low growth but i would now conclude with the current situation of pandemic this is right now having a negative growth this industry right so as of now i can conclude that we are at this point the decline point correct yes and also because you are aware that uh, boeing 737 max it had a couple of accidents in the last so many years many of its planes have you know uh, had technical issues so the industry is also going through a bad phase and about that you had pandemic and travel ban which has completely destroyed the segment so even though if there is huge opportunity the segment is at so much of a bottom that it does not make sense for many to enter clear <clears throat> so this is what the life cycle curve is uh, life cycle graph is where based your demand is based your de the graph tells you the demand based on the stage with respect to time right so as the time proceeds the company starts from a basic stage a growth stage uh 
the startup and the growth stage and eventually it peaks out. So let's focus on each stage. The first is the embryonic stage. Embryonic stage is the stage, as I said, it's a startup stage where the company is, where the industry is just at the, at the initial stage, the industry product is now new in the market. So the growth is relatively slow because customers are not aware about it. For example, uh, this cab services, five to seven years back, cab services was a very new thing. Right, people who are taking time to adapt to this new system, isn't it? So customers were not aware about it. They were they were not aware. They were in two minds whether to go for it or not. Right. Therefore, the companies had to invest heavily into technology, heavily into marketing and all. Right. So there were very high prices initially. The prices cannot be reduced as the volume necessary for economies of scale had not been reached. And there is huge investment in the initial stage, as I said, right? But there's also very high risk of failure. So most of the startups or uh, most of the, uh, when a new industry is coming up altogether, there is a very high chance of that being a failure because uh, most of the companies fail because of heavy spending and not being able to profit, right? That's called the embryonic stage. Second is a growth stage. Growth stage where the industry has settled down. They are not in now too much of a failure risk. So the growth is happening very fast because now the customers are aware about the company. They know about the company's product and, you know, the company's product probably has become a rage with the youngsters or with the population, right? Initially, there are very few compete. There is a little competition because the growth is too high that it has for everyone, right? So when there is, there was this e-commerce surge, there were so many e-commerce companies and there was potential for everyone because the market is so huge. The prices are now falling. Why? Because companies are now producing enough. So they are now getting economies of scale. Correct? The profits are increasing because the, relatively there is less competition and high growth. Correct? That's a growth stage. So in growth stage, you would find huge demand. Therefore, the profits are high. The costs are low because of economies of scale and because the competition is low, correct? So things are very great in the growth stage. Things start, you know, declining, uh, not drastically, but the thing starts looking, uh, you know, worrying with the shakeout stage. In the shakeout stage, now the competition is becoming intense. The competition is growing. And the competition is growing more than the growth. Correct. So due to heavy competition, the industry growth and profitability are slowing in this stage. So I've mentioned here the slowing growth, the growth has now, the growth is there. It's positive growth, but the growth has now, it's gradually now getting saturated. Okay. It has not yet saturated, but it is moving towards saturation. Clear. The competition is increasing and now new competitors are taking the additional share. Right. Gradually what will happen? there will be more of production and less of demand, correct? So the industry is gradually getting into overcapacity. Are you getting it? Right? What will happen eventually? There will be increased cost cutting. Why? Because the profit margins have squeezed. The demand is less, the supply is more, the production is more. And the competition is now gradually increasing. So the margins are getting squeezed. Are you getting it? So shakeout stage is perhaps you can say is a signal for you that things are going to be really not great for the industry. Okay. Can you give me an example of a shakeout stage now? Any particular industry or segment which you see that is at this stage where the profits have now started falling? Any idea? Any example? Yes. Any any industry which you feel is moving from growth to checkout stage? Anyone? Any idea? Now, yeah. Like uh, any rental market is okay because everybody is doing work from home. Like most of the people, like Correct. there is no... correct. 
So there were these many companies which were selling commercial apartments, which were giving lease, commercial apartments on lease. First of all, there were already too many companies doing it, right? And then the competition started to grow. Of course, now we are dealing with a stage of pandemic where every business model is now in the dustbin. Nothing is working. That's a separate story. But otherwise, uh, yes, when too many players were starting to enter, the competition was becoming very intense. Yes, you can say uh, about the rental markets. But uh, more of, more of, I mean, if it was not pandemic, it was not that big an issue. But still, that particular industry which you feel was going through a shakeout stage before the pandemic, where the uh, where they have mentioned here that the investment exceeds the demand and there is an overcapacity. So I'll tell you that you know uh, steel industry was facing that issue. That China was producing so much of steel which wasn't even required, and then the prices started crashing because the supply and the production uh, went way ahead the went way ahead of the demand got it see the demand for steel or these heavy industries is based on economic cycle so if the economic cycle is not performing there will not be a great demand of steel now china started producing a lot of steel um, right from the beijing olympic times and they are building the country they have a tendency to overproduce everything so that they get economies of scale isn't it but mm. then if they can't sell that what do they do they what is the they have an advantage of economies of scale because of which the production cost becomes very low but then what is that they do if they are not able to sell in their own country are they, are they producing only to sell in china no they can do it internationally. They try to dump those excess production all over the world. So already steel market, which was so competitive, China started dumping huge amount of steel in Europe, in Canada, in India, and in so many markets. And that was so cheap that the existing steel companies started feeling the heat. Okay. This completely happened because of the overproduction. So the steel industry has substantially went through this stage, shakeout stage. And eventually what happened, the steel industry, you know, went into, into a negative growth. That's happened. That's, that's the reason why large steel companies of the world are on the verge of bankruptcy or many have already become bankrupt. Okay. That's because of uh, overcapacity, right? Here, an interesting thing is increased cost cutting. Firms restructure to survive and attempt to bring brand loyalty. Brand loyalty is a situation where you realize that later part, in the later part, what is going to happen? Your business is going to reduce. And at that time, the company should buy from you because of the brand loyalty. So now, uh, you know, when, when I say in India, uh, when, when the cement market is not performing, but when the market is not performing and still I want to buy cement, I may go to buy cement from a very famous company like Ambuja or ACC, right? Because that's what the brand loyalty they have over the period or Birla, correct? So when you realize that in the long run, my business will face out a shakeout or a declining stage. So you start building into the brand loyalty so that eventually customers will come to you even during the bad phase, right? So after shakeout stage, then comes a mature stage. Mature stage is the point where the companies, where the industry is peaked out. Okay. Mature stage is the stage where the firms begin, begin to consolidate it. This is a stage where the prices are stable. The growth has started slowing up, right? Because the product is saturated. Now, not too many people will buy, uh, will, will too many companies will enter into the product because the profits are very low. And it will so happen that many companies will, many companies will go out of the business, right? So the market shares will of large com, large firms gain market share with better production and sales, with better products and sales consolidation. Only few players will be left. The market will become more like an oligopoly. 
there are now very high entry barriers because the existing firms have huge brand loyalty and now no new firms will be able to enter here because the growth is so slow that only those companies which are well established they will they will make profits new companies will find it very difficult to get profits the profit is not lucrative enough for new companies to enter the prices are stable so firms try to avoid price war except during recession so that's what i said about pepsi and coca cola now they are more into the mature stage clear pepsi and coca cola are more into mature stage now there is rare possibility of new companies uh, getting into the beverage segment hardly there are four or five companies globally into the beverage segment at such a high scale clear Finally, you have a decline stage where the growth rate has turned negative. It's not going to grow. Negative growth, global competition, substitute availability, preference changes. People have started consuming less of sugar-related, uh, uh, you know, soda products. Right? Do you now see, uh, you know, except suppose suppose if you don't go to McDonald's, there is a very rare possibility that people will now these days buy a Coke or a Pepsi. Isn't it? Why? Any idea why people have all of a sudden started having less of Coke and Pepsi? A drink because there are other options available. Ah, uh, other options available as in? Can you give me some name beyond Coke and Pepsi? Like um, more healthy versions. Yes, health is a concern now. Now we all are aware that how unhealthy these uh, you know soft drink products are. Correct. So people have become more health conscious. So people are shutting away from these products. That's the reason why after forty years, Coca Cola has now entered into uh, you know from soft drinks they have now into entered into alcohol segment. They have also taken I think uh, uh, Costa Coffee. They are now entering into the coffee segment. So they are changing their product dynamics. Coca Cola has uh, now more of health conscious products. No, of course they had Diet Coke, which they had issued, uh, you know, forty years back, I think. But uh, now their focus is more on, uh, you know, less sugar related products. So that's what the industry is completely changing, right? Because the preference of the consumers are changing. The consumers have become now more health conscious. Now. already there is huge capacity over capacity and excess competition so there is reduction in prices just imagine the prices that you paid to buy a bottle or a can of coke then and now it's a such a big difference right i i remember uh, uh, that in uh, uae uh, where you know it's it's very ironical it was very very strange for me where Uh, a cup of tea, a cup of tea for me was two dirham. Okay, a cup of tea. A can of Coca Cola was one point five dirham. Right, and a liter of petrol is less than two dirham, around two dirham. And a bottle of water is also two dirham. So just imagine the things that you get in two dirham. Two dirham is equivalent to forty rupees in India, or you know, four dirham is around one dollar. So just imagine what are you getting in two dirham, and that's what I realize. It's uh, it's so strange there that if you just compare in that two dirham, I was getting a tea was two dirham, a cup of tea, but Coca Cola and Pepsi were less than two dirham, which is not the case in our country, right? You would get a tea in India at at what at five five rupee maximum, but if you want a can of a, a can of Coca Cola, you will have to pay forty fifty rupees. Are you getting it? So it's eight times the value here in India. Of course, there I saw it. Just people are hardly consuming it. So there, the tea was more costlier. The water was more costlier than a can of Coke. Correct. so this is what happens so in the decline stage since the growth is negative many companies many companies which do not have enough cash reserves they will go out of the business or they will merge or will be taken over by another company clear right 
So what matters apart from the competitive edge is that what industry life cycle your company is into. That is very, very crucial. So industry life cycle is a very crucial point before you decide upon which company you want to invest into. Clear? Yes. No. Uh, but, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Also in the declining uh, mm. stage, mm. after de- if, the, uh, if any company is in declining, Mm-hmm. stage so can okay. we say that the company will shut down or okay so that's what i'm now coming to so declining stage is not the end game now i told you what is coca cola doing now what is it doing it's shifting to some other businesses yes diversification probably you'll have to now change the way you do business and this is where strategic analysis plays a crucial role. And that's what I, uh, you know what, even I thought that, oh, what should happen now with the companies are declining stage, so the company's done? No, Coca-Cola is still one of the largest, uh, the most valuable brands in the world. Mm-hmm. And you'll be surprised that uh, I just saw, you know, even in this pandemic, you know, what is the volume of Coca-Cola? I think it, its revenue was $9 billion. Compared to that, Pepsi, I think, had $15 billion of revenue. So, uh, contrary to what we thought that Coca-Cola will shut now, who is going to have these products? Contrary to uh, to that, in 2020, Coca-Cola and Pepsi and 2021, their business have actually jumped. You know, surprisingly, their business have actually jumped. And I'll tell you why, because of external influences. What are external influences? There are various factors beyond the industry, I mean, outside the industry, which does affect the industry. These factors affect the industry growth, profitability, and risk. And therefore, they are a very important component of your strategic analysis. Now, what are these factors? Macroeconomic. For example, the GDP, growth rate, interest rate, inflation, and so on. Macroeconomic is fine. Second, technology, very, very crucial, very crucial. So even if the product, let's say, uh, the, uh, you know, why did Nokia went out of business completely? Blackberry went out of business because of the change in technology, right? So yes. technological developments can all of a sudden vanish a, you know, years old company or probably make a company multi-bagger, a multi-billion dollar company. So technology is such factor which will disrupt the entire life cycle of the company that we just saw. Right? So if you're somewhere here, the company is mature or in the declining stage, but then all of a sudden it's, it has come out with a you know, path-breaking technology, then all of a sudden you, you will find, uh, you know, the company, not the industry company beating all the industry life cycle. For example, what Tesla did, the auto industry was in rubbles. The car industry was in rubbles after the uh, 2007 financial crisis. But after that also Tesla, you know, saw a huge, see now when, when things are going bad in the world, Tesla is performing so great. I mean, I'm not questioning about the stock price. I, I'm not there to comment about the stock price. Some people say it is exceptionally too high and so on. And that's a different discussion altogether. But it was a technological disruption which, you know, kept uh, Tesla out of the industry cycle. It actually broke the chain of the entire industry cycle, right? So technology can completely reinforce growth or completely shut down a business. Correct? Yes. Now, what we were discussing about Coca-Cola and Pepsi, they started changing their product mix. They started getting more into health conscious products. That is because of the demography. Now, people, uh, now we, we have more youngsters who are more health conscious. They are more diet conscious, even though we have a lot of obese people now, but we are at least conscious about the diet more than we were before. So based on that, uh, you know, for example, right now, uh, we say that, you know, India is mm, struggling economy and all, but still the global world is betting on India because of its demography, because it has 
countries like india and saudi arabia these countries may not be developed nations but they have the population which is the most uh, you know the highest young population is what these countries have so the demography is such that you know this is the golden period for these countries the same was with china 10 years back china had highest number of young working age population that helped china that 20 years helped china build where it is okay so demography plays a very important role in in that disruption of that uh, industry life sector government laws government taxes government policies can also play a big role here and finally social influence as to what we were just saying the working condition the spending habits the social life the status these are all more important for uh, you know uh, for people today so they would prefer a, a you know a better housing now now you know a couple of years back people wanted houses uh, nearby uh, you know main market place and they didn't care about uh, what amenities they have right they just cared about what that we should have enough space and cheap that's what was primary concern but these days people want to live in a more nature environment correct they want to yeah. be in a more natural environment they want uh, many amenities in their houses so this is what people have now started asking this is what people want now that's it that is the new social norm so people are spending more than what they were initially so if this factors are changing that will definitely affect the industry and the company overall correct so coming back to your question can you repeat your question and I'll, that's where your answer is yes um my question was like in the declining stage a co- like a company in a declining stage will mm-hmm. it shut down after after this stage so then it is based on the company what company is now going to do what is how the company is now going to change for uh, i'll i'll tell you my experience that uh, now it's a very it's not a complete comparison to that i'll just share you my experience that uh, now what has happened to all the educational providers in the pandemic what has happened to them traditionally people used to go at venues and do the coaching right yes correct what has happened off late now everyone is doing online coaching correct yes but is it profitable for everyone is it beneficial for everyone is it affordable for everyone is it uh, compatible or easy for everyone well those who are not doing online coaching they are really struggling it those who are still not investing in technology they are struggling struggling it yes right so uh, you know i had uh, started doing online coaching you know four or five years back already of course i was doing offline coaching also but more of i was doing online coaching so when the pandemic did hit many of my colleagues were finding it very difficult to adjust to the new norm of taking online sessions and uh, many of the students were also initially very much like that why should we see a recorded lecture it's live experience is altogether different which i understand but what will happen now two things those who are not technologically uh, you know advanced they are now having uh, you know they are now forced to adopt the technology correct they are now forced to adopt and they are finding it very difficult they are finding it difficult and the students are also finding it difficult right so i can understand the costs have reduced but that does not mean you don't invest in technology for example i was paying 100000 rent every month so at one end i can say oh i have saved enough for the rent but that does not mean i should not invest in technology i should invest in systems i should invest in delivering better to my clients better to my students with having more now now since i have an advantage of technology why not share links with my students in the live session why not give them a more uh, comprehensive experience now if you don't invest in all this thing if you're not used to all this thing then you'll then you'll be shut down out of the business you'll be out of the business so from decline then the only option you have is to get out of the industry so 
my my answer here is that regular investment in technology is what i feel is completely a drastical change so these cycles may not affect you if you are if you are you know investing regularly in technology if you are having the nick of what's happening in the global markets what's happening what how are things changing up how are the dynamics changing up what is going to happen to you know the country the economy all these factors you should see now i'll tell you one thing what will happen after the things end up do you think offline classes will shut no people will again go back to the classrooms for the lectures right yes but the comfort that people have got with online sessions is that just 5 minute before the session you get ready and you sit right but before that you had to probably take up your car reach out to the destination worry for the parking then reach out to the class if you were late the professor used to scold at you if you missed the session you had to go somewhere there were now you realize there were so many hardships that you went through to go to physic to physically go to a lecture right so i feel there will be a drastic social change which is going to stay forever it's not going to it was just not temporary now people will prefer more of online sessions than offline session it's completely going to change the industry okay now even if you go for a classroom session you would still want that what if i miss a session i would want the recording are you getting it so i believe that the online sessions will stay the offline sessions will also be there but the social and the you know the demographic part has changed so much and with the help of technology and easy technology like zoom and all i think this is just going to be remarkable so this has so people who have adopted uh, this technology and adapted themselves to it they will probably be saved otherwise uh, they will they will probably see a growth also later on but otherwise then if you have not invested in technology and all then then you'll be out of the business just like the blackberry and the okay. nokia as you said right so they were the starters of the messaging and the mm-hmm. applications but they have to constantly change so when you are making profits you have to reinvest heavily into future survival also so i'll, I'll just share you because you are now friends also for me uh, what i did is that uh, you know i i had uh, this office and studio i had created before the batch so i had few friends and few relatives of mine that why are you spending so much in you know this very studio required you can just take sessions from your home i said no it does this is this is what i want to deliver this is what i want to be differentiated from others i don't know how successful i'll be but i need a user to see a very good environment when he sees a live session from me not like a typical zoom session where they see you know professor having an abrupt face and the student having an you know improper audio and video and connectivity issues no i had i ensured that i had the best connectivity i ensured that i had enough of uh, you know uh, technology at place so before i got the fees i had, i had estimated that this is the amount of fees i will get and more than that i had invested in the technology so this is what i do i i, I you know out of whatever i earn i'll be very honest my savings are very less why because one third of the amount i reinvest in technology buying so many gadgets now you know i'll show you at times you know the the things that i sit with the huge amount of gadgets that i have i have a very high end desktop macbook two laptops ipads not for fun you know i i use it for different purposes then i have so many different you know wires and dongles and all things to connect i i keep on investing it so that it becomes easier to deliver so that you are not stuck up with anything like high end cameras and all so all these things are regular one third of my amount that i make i invest heavily into technology i love that the other one third i spend in traveling so i i am left with <laughs> few money but uh, that's what i do because i feel that if you don't reinvest in your business and yourself both 
then you'll be out of uh, you'll be out like an industry cycle you you'll mature very easily this is just not industry cycle this is life cycle so if you want to this is if you want to survive this life cycle you don't want to end up like a retirement a bad retirement then you have to consistently invest in yourself your business you know just because your business is giving you money don't start saving and investing in house and all you need to invest in your business also you need to invest in yourself because i am the product for this business so i have to invest in myself and what makes me happy i have to invest in that so travel and technology is where my maximum money goes i don't have enough money for my house but i'm sure i have enough money for my travel and technology okay so i so to answer your question finally it's it's the uh technological and other factors which also influence a lot uh, uh these are they are called external factors but they influence a lot your industry life cycle clear yes finally after all this thing you go to company analysis and company analysis what are the factors or elements that you should cover in company analysis well we have dealt with many of them company analysis includes analysis of company's financial position so you'll check out the ratios and financial statements right products and service and the competitive strategy now you know how to analyze the competitive strategy with porter's five forces the analyst should try to determine if the strategy is primarily defensive or offensive defensive strategy means means the company is trying to uh, you know invest less and get more profits or companies being offensive means it is getting into intense price battle and investing heavily and how the company in, intends to implement the strategy so there are two chief strategies a low cost strategy what is a low cost strategy where you want to get market share by having a low cost advantage so here the firm seeks to have the lowest cost of production in the industry how is that possible what china does i said why china has to have low cost scale because of youth scale right yes so the firm seeks to have lowest cost of production in its industry offer the lowest price and generate enough volume to make superior return so i said it's the volume the scale which makes countries like china you know having a low cost leadership so their focus is clear they want to be low cost leader they want to beat the market with low cost leadership correct of course that's what i'm not saying chinese are not good at innovations they are good but china is following more like a korean market uh, you know i should say a korean market uh, you know model when initially korea and japan were known to be like china if you it will be very surprising for you to know that korea and japan were more like said to be those who duplicate the products so they started with copying the products and being a low cost market then they were invested heavily into innovation along with that money and now they are you know high technological end products that korea and japan makes mm -hmm. so china is also perhaps on the same path now five years down the line you will definitely see five years is also too far you will not know china only for low cost products but you will also know china for high quality products right that's what will happen very uh, very much soon you think that china is only known for low cost well china is aware about that and china knows that this is not going to be uh, i mean it's more smarter than all of us let's let's accept that fact so it knows that right now i need to break the market with low cost and then i need to give an advantage of technology also okay but first it is trying to erase the competition by having low cost so no one will be there and then then it will come up with innovation and all that's what is happening with huawei a company like huawei which is a prominent company in 5g so much so that it's challenging us government right it's just not because it's low cost it's also because of the technology xiaomi and all these companies like uh, you know the uh, honor this phone companies most of the phone companies that you see from china they just don't sell cheap phones now they also have quality aspects in their electronic products gradually you will see that of course but unfortunately china is dealing with that uh, you know stigma of cheap products but that you you won't uh, find that after 5 years 
even japan and uh, korea face the same stigma now they don't face that stigma anymore correct mm-hmm. i would like to add uh, on this yeah. so uh, as i like i'm working for a retail uh, industry mm-hmm. so this like walmart is mm-hmm. is a low low cost strategy company correct Be- and it has its own scale if uh, like a case study because it's so good in supply chain right in the low like in low cost mm-hmm. and uh, like a uh, high volume mm. it, it's uh, you know walmart's model and uh, ikea's model mm-hmm. they are all on the same line yes that they will be low cost and high scale high high yes so they will maintain that cost leadership and no one will be able to reach out close to them very soon because the massive volume that they have the massive infrastructure now they have and the cost the lower cost that they have it's very difficult for others to beat them in 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 their market at least so they've yes. got that leadership basically which will be very difficult for others to replace clear now that's a strategy which comes after ages but once it comes you are going to be the dominant player for for long mm-hmm. you'll you'll find companies way far unless you know a company like amazon which has a completely different platform altogether which now sells more than walmart but on a different platform so that technological disruption again if you would see that can only disrupt everything that technological advancement that can only disrupt otherwise you know cost leadership survives for long mm-hmm. okay now we we've seen walmart for what so many years it's still the leader and it will be the leader for i don't know when because now what walmart is doing that now walmart is also investing heavily into online sales technology robots algorithm many things big data many. research and all so walmart is not just being a traditional uh, retailer now it's also investing heavily into technology to meet up the you know competitors correct so you have to be not two steps ahead but you have to be 20 steps ahead of your competitors you have to think 20 years down the line okay so that's that's one way of being competitive that is low cost strategy low cost the second is that your product should be so unique that that others will find it difficult for example here we are going to see products or service differentiation firms try to have products and services that are distinct in type of quality or delivery can you give me an example here that the product is so unique from apple yes very good now it's such a unique product now many of the features you may find same but the operating system is so unique that it's not an you know easy comparison between two phones mm-hmm. now you just don't fi- i mean uh, this is my experience okay before i bought an apple phone for me buying between phone was only because of the price price was the only factor right now after having every gadget with me of apple i am so much addicted to the ecosystem of apple the cloud the uh, operating system it's so unique for me my business is so much integrated that this is a differentiation for which i will buy apple only and now price is not at all a factor for me are you getting it yes so that's the product differentiation which will keep you way ahead of the others so you need to give that premium service i think which will define you from others otherwise you won't stand in the competition with just price for long by just you know lowering the price so i'll tell you one of the jokes here that oh, you know a couple of years back uh, during my other courses of ca i saw everyone reducing the price of their courses so i said that i don't want to reduce the price i don't want to go into the price battle because i can't win with the big coaching institutes they have enough money to spend at holdings and digital marketing and professors and so on so they have more of strength than me to beat me in pricing i can't compete with a walmart if i am a small e-tailer so same way i can't beat the 
global giants in you know coaching industry in pricing i realized that so when they were reducing the prices what i started i did not reduce the price i started adding few features to the course so that i can clearly tell someone that you know you get in thousand dollars you get this from one institute but in thousand dollar you get this 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 is from me so i always thought i'm not saying i'm highly successful with this thought but i'm just saying that i always believe that your whatever you charge it should be value for money to the user only then the user will come to you otherwise he has several options so product differentiation is what my belief of business has always been because i don't i don't think so i'll reach to that scale individually like walmart where i'll dominate of course if that happens great but till that i want to survive in the tide with the differentiation of the product so someone should be able to identify that yes this is a unique thing which i get from this compared to others that's what i want to make so i ensure that i have more number of hours compared to others i have more in depth thing so some people get bored that why it is so in depth but that's what i want to maintain i want to maintain that practical aspect of my teaching and the exam perspective of the teaching that's what i want to strike a balance into so i always see that what is where is i am unique and what more value addition i can give to the user and then i can charge the premium otherwise i i can't charge the premium that's what you know you need to try doing it you may or may not be successful but product differentiation is what many companies want to do clear yes so these are all factors should be covered so overall what are the elements that should be covered you should have a firm overview about its operations and you know the strengths and weaknesses of its operations we've discussed the industry characteristics that you need to analyze before uh, concluding about a company you need to analyze the product demand and cost factors right how competitive that is pricing environment uh, is it intense uh, are you able to charge high prices or not is it controlled by the government or not right all these factors you will analyze and see before uh, you know uh, getting shortly li- shortlisting the companies then you will check out the ratio analysis so ideally in fra we studied that we do the ratio analysis but before ratio analysis before seeing some prominent ratios like roe return on equity these are the factors that you will consider you know before uh, reaching out to you know the company that you want to analyze finally as we discussed financial ratios like roe we have discussed about roe in fra 3 way 2 way and 5 way roe this is what we call as dupont analysis you remember that net profit margin turnover ratios and uh, leverages based on that you can you can uh, perhaps find this is not a 5 way this is a 3 way roe in a 5 way roe what additional two things comes interest margin tax margin profit margin asset turnover right uh, and then basically financial leverage so a five way uh, roe also you can calculate right various uh, components of roe will tell you that what are the reasons your your roe is increasing or decreasing so before you reach financial ratios you should be probably covering up various other factors of the industry and then you should go for financial statement projections and valuations correct now in order to do projections and valuations you will take the help of spreadsheet so you'll take the help of excel or spreadsheet modeling where you will take all the factors that you feel that will affect the companies and that will you will eventually get all this into all this into finding out the growth rate of the of your company's revenue and profits so analysts often use spreadsheet modeling to analyze and forecast company fundamentals spreadsheet modeling is used to forecast revenues operating profits cash flows net income and every you, you basically create a hypothetical financial statement using the spreadsheet by the projections right but yes now you will consider the industry and the sector and the life cycle stages and the uh, components or, or the factors which affects its competitiveness all these factors now you will consider before doing this uh, you know spreadsheet modeling the spreadsheet modeling is most widely tool so uh, used tool so when you go into the industry and you become an analyst you will be definitely using the spreadsheet modeling the problem with this modeling is that they are too complex and uh, there can be huge error i remember the day i joined uh, you know the research company uh, you know 
the spreadsheet models which i saw of one of my colleagues was so complex that i realized that i can't work on it i'll have to create my own model but many newcomers uh, generally face a problem that they may not realize the errors that they are doing in the model because the models are too lengthy they run into multiple pages uh, and multiple worksheets and at times your research report can be filled with errors which no one will be able to identify because no one does the audit of your spreadsheet models so that's the problem with these spreadsheet models but otherwise the entire industry uses the spreadsheet modeling and they take various factors into consideration so conclusion that this industry and company analysis you know requires all of these factors to be considered before you go for the valuation so after all these factors are considered then you go for company valuation using present value or discounting cash flow models relative valuation models and asset based valuation models which we we, we see in the equity valuation topic clear well that's the end of this particular topic of introduction to industry and company analysis and valuation any doubts or anything please let me know anyone any doubts nothing so far okay. okay that's it thank you for the session and if any doubts do let me know later on or we'll meet in the next session okay okay thank you yeah take care bye bye